Hi, right, so we'll be going over the uh, data input output lecture on in the intro to R. So again, if you don't know where these lecture slides are, you should be able to go to johnmichelli.com slash intro to R, and then down on the set of links, you should be able to go to data IO or data input output, and I'm using the HTML slides for this, but the PDF should also be available. So data input and output in R. So everything we'll be doing in class, we'll be using uh, real publicly available data. There should be few or little to no toy examples or simulated data, and the data has come from Open Baltimore or data.gov, and those are the data sources we will have. We also have added the functionality to make things easier to load these data sets directly in JHUR after this lecture is done, if you're using it for labs. But for the most part, the point of this lecture is to show you how to get data into R. So again, reading in data is the first step of any real project or data analysis. R can read almost any file format, especially with add-on packages. The most common ones are simple text delimited files like .txts, .csvs. You can read in Excel files. You can read in Stata files. You can read in SAS files, SPSS files, um, things from SQL databases, a whole different slew of different options. Uh, that you have in there, but it can read in almost anything unless you have a very bespoke data type. So one of the data sets we'll be using is the Youth Tobacco Survey, which um, was a survey for uh, teens about smoking and tobacco use, and it's broken down by state to state. So if you want more information about it, you can click here. Uh, that's done nationwide. So the data that you will be using is the youth tobacco survey that we exported. If you click the link here, I will show you that in a minute. Um, and it should download to your computer. If it doesn't, especially if you're in uh, Safari, you can go to file, save as, and make sure the page format is page source and save it as a CSV. And then um, if we click, we should see it opening up there. So you can change things in our studio session. Again, we're going to be using our studio projects. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this. I'm going to open up my. So this is the folder, which is my project. So earlier this week, we probably made a project on our desktop, maybe called intro to R. So I'm going to actually double click that intro to R dot our proj or my project, whatever you actually created, um, any of them is fine. Just double click that our project folder and now you should have a R session loaded up that is the specific one for this class and you should see intro to R and it'll tell you where it is. You'll see that the directory has changed. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to take that file that we had just downloaded and I'm gonna plop it into that directory. So if we look in the files pane down here, we will see that that CSV file is indeed in there. Okay, so now we have our project open, we have the directory, uh, the data in the directory, and now what are we gonna do? So our studio has actually some nice down drop down support where you can run tasks by selecting them from the toolbar. Again, we've spoken about this. It's not necessarily for statistical analysis, but data import, it has really good drop down options. For example, if you go to file import data set from CSV, it'll bring up a new screen that lets you specify the formatting of your text file and you get the code that actually shows you how to import it. So let's jump back to our studio. I'll go back to my project file. And then we go down to import data set and there's a bunch of different options. There are two options here for text-based data. Always choose the one that says read R, which I will discuss in a minute why. And as you saw in there, there were options for Excel, SPSS, SAS, and Stata. So I'm gonna browse. I'm in the folder we had. I'm gonna click the youth tobacco survey. I'm gonna wait a minute. It's gonna show me some things moving and then it shows me a snapshot of what the data would look like if it was read in this way. Now, certain data formats have headers or skip lines or a bunch of different stuff, or the first you know, line is not a header row, so the first no is right as names. If we unclick that, then things will actually look quite different um, because it'll just assume that each column is unnamed and each one of these things is just data. 
So in this case though, the first row are names. So if we do click that, we can see what the um, output looks like. So the year will be imported as a double, which is also a numeric, just a number column. Location will be characters. Um, and if we keep going down, there should be some other things like date, data value, which are all numbers, um, characters, doubles. So the only thing I wanna, I wanna note here is here is the code. So it's gonna load this read our package, which is a very helpful package for reading in func um, any type of data being mostly text-based data. It's very fast. It gives you a lot of nice verbose output so you can see what's going on. It's gonna read the data in using read underscore CSV. It's gonna assign it to this output, this youth tobacco survey underscore YTS underscore data. It's gonna read in just this file straight away because it knows that it's in our project. We don't have to specify any long hard path. We can just specify the path as is and then it's gonna open it in a viewer. Now, all this is great, except when you're working with data sets or something like that, any type of object in R, for the most part, you probably want to do something where it's a short, you know, easy to type command. I also am a very big fan of lowercase. So all I changed was the name. So everything is exactly the same, except when you run this code, then the object is going to be called YTS versus that youth underscore tobacco underscore survey underscore YTS underscore data object because that's a lot to type out and we don't want to have to do that over and over again, especially if we're doing any data manipulations. So if I click import, we see what actually came out of here. So it ran the command and we see this verbose output that said, I parsed the columns with this specific specification. Now what it does is it guesses based on, you know, the first thousand rows uh, to see, oh, I think this data value is actually a number. I think this is a number. I think this is a number. And the default is for all the other ones uh, than these specific columns, it says, I just want to keep that as a character. I don't think it's a number. Now, there's a function called problems. It's in the radar package. And if you type that on there, it should tell you if there are any problems with the data. Like I just told you, it guesses to say, I think this column is of this type. And if it guesses wrong, it says, hey, actually, I thought these were integers and I see stuff with decimals later. Ooh, I think that might be a problem. I'm going to call NA. That's very um, scary in some respects. So you can either give the specification itself, which I'll show you in a minute, or you can tell it to guess on more rows and hopefully it captures that. Now, there's another command, stop for problems, which you can put in your scripts, which is super helpful to say, if this data ever changes, anything goes wrong, and you actually have problems in the future, just break the code so it flags me and say, hey, you better check this out. <clears throat> now, you also see this message that says, see spec dot 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 for full column specifications. What it means is, you say spec, and then you put in the data set. Now, if you don't see these functions spec or problems or stop for problems, then you probably just need to load in the read our package. We will get into more detail about loading packages up, but you have the read our package installed on your computer. The library command up here tells R, I want to be able to use these functions, load them up in this session. So if we do spec, it gives us a thing we could potentially copy and paste. And this is the specification for every single column of our data set. So what we could have done you could say call types, call. So again, if you open this up in our studio, uh, you can hit tab and it'll show you all the different arguments of this function. If we say call types and we paste this really, really, really big thing, it specifies directly every single specification that we could ever want for all these columns. We could have also used this as the specification if that's what we believe. Um, so for example, sometimes this guess is wrong. So what if the data value actually should be a number, but it treated it as a character? Well, we'd want to change that. So the way this is specified, you have to put this calls thing around it and it's the data column name, right? So you have to know the columns of the data set before you do this equals call underscore some sort of type. So call character means it's a character, call underscore logical means it's trues or falses, call underscore double means it's a number. And again, this view command will bring up the viewer and allow us to explore the data um, for the first, in this case, uh, 12 rows and 30 columns. But again, the viewer has a maximum of about 50 columns. So if you're importing a very, very big data set, you might want to subset these, which we will talk about in the data manipulation lecture. Okay, now you got data in there. Reading CSVs, one of the most common uh, things to do. So you definitely want to be able to get a good handle on this.
So um, also read underscore CSV has the added nice capability of being able to read in URLs directly. So if we go back one slide or two, we see that the data was here. I could have copied this URL directly and put this into the um, argument for the path. And in this case, I called it my dat, and I'm using the equal sign instead of the assignment operator, the less than or dash, but it's still doing the assignment of my dat. And then head is just a function that will show the first six rows of a data set so just so we can get a snapshot. But you see it's called a tibble, which is again like a data frame, which we'll use pretty commonly. It's a rectangular data set. It's like a spreadsheet in many respects. It has rows and columns. Every column has the same number of rows. All these are bound together. And um, when it's a tibble versus a data frame, you see these nice markers saying what column it is, right? So this is a character, this is a double, things like that. Um, so that's the long and short of it, what gets read in and the data format you get. So what's really going on behind the scenes? There is a worker function in the background that's really close to read underscore CSV called read underscore delim. This is kind of a more generic function. So let's say you're like, oh, my thing's comma, my semicolon separated, right? Instead of comma separated, you could use read underscore delim where you tell it the delimiter. So in this case, if you do quote uh, forwards or um, backslash T, that stands for tab. So a tab delimited file, this is one way you can read in a tab delimited file. Again, the way you know which a slash is a forward or a backward, it's like fencing. If you slash forward, right, or to the right in this case, it's a forward slash, like this is a backslash, okay? So you would say, you know, dash T if it was tab delimited, semicolon if it was semicolon delimited, so on and so forth. And this, these are all the different arguments you can pass into this function. So if you did read underscore delim in our studio and you hit tab, you would see all these arguments pop up and an indicator of what they mean. So one of the, the few that you should really uh, note, trim underscore WS means trim white space. Should that be true or false? Uh, progress, do you want it to show progress? If it's a very, very big file, like a gig or something like that, then it'll show you the progress on how much it's reading in at any given time. Skip. Like I said before, if there were any header rows that's just like this data, a description, and then it actually jumps down to the real data and you wanna skip the first five rows, this is what you would use. Um, N max is the, num the maximum number of rows it will read in. So if you only wanna read a subset of the, data, of the data, you should check this. Guess underscore max is the number of rows it should read in before it guesses the column types. And it's hard to see because it's cut off here a little bit, but it's the min of a thousand and N max. So the min of a thousand and infinity is obviously a thousand. So it takes the first thousand rows, says this is the data types I'm guessing you want unless you gave that specification. So again, make sure your, your path to your file is in quotes. It's read as a path. It's a character string. It needs to be in quotes. Otherwise, R is going to try to think it's an R object and do some funky things. So again, the function will look in your working directory if no absolute path is given. So we'll talk about working directories in a second. And note that the file name can also be a path on a website or a URL. So again, the function that we really use was reader, read r underscore CSV, read underscore CSV. So again, very similar to read underscore delim, maybe with uh, uh, some fewer options, but you see uh, some other things like column names equals true, column types equals null, and that's where we put that specification. Guest max is still in there. Skip is still in there. Uh, trim white space in this in this function by default is true, so it will trim white space from those things. NA, which is the missing character in R, will be quote, quote, or NA. So if it finds just the capital letters NA in there or just an empty string, it will turn those things into proper missing values in R, um, which is represented by NA, but no quotes around it. So if you have N slash A's in there, for example, lowercase NA's in there, you want to put these in this argument so R will convert them to NA's if you want. So um, alternatively, this is another way we could have done it. Read underscore CSV and this relative path to our directory. So um, if, for example, the directory we were in, there was a... Um, another folder called data that was one level up and if you went over down in the data that file was in there that's how you'd specify it so this is a way of giving a relative path which we'll talk about now so again common 
uh, mistakes we've seen new users have or issues really. So working directory problems, trying to read files that are quote unquote can't find. So using our studio projects can really help because everything is in relative to that primary directory. So if you had a data subfolder, it wouldn't be dot dot, it would just be data slash this, right? If there was a folder in the project called data. So typos, this is a lot of reasons why we really talk about tab completion, hitting tabs to complete the name of the file, to complete you know, uh, the name of a variable or a data set, um, lowercase and uppercase X are different. So you wanna make sure that you're specifying the right thing because if you don't, either it'll cause an error or it's gonna be grabbing a different object in R. So data type problems, we showed you that with the problems function and the spec function. You know, if you read something and that's like age, but somebody has the word missing in there for age and you start trying to create a mean, then you can't take the mean of that. It's a character. R doesn't understand how to, you know, average words. So you have to then convert that thing to a numeric or you have to specify in your reading function how to actually turn that into missing. Open-ended quotes, parentheses, and brackets, right? So you have to put uh, it's a function, parentheses, then the arguments, or if you open a quote, a double quote, you have to end it with a double quote. Um, sometimes curly braces or brackets uh, are a lot of problems where some one of them is missing and it's really hard to see sometimes. Also different versions of software, but we should have mitigated that by everybody having the new version of R in our studio. So really briefly, there are two functions that are really useful, get WD, set WD. Get WD stands for get working directory, set WD stands for set working directory. Now, if you're working in the RStudio projects, you shouldn't have to do this, okay? I wanna hammer that home. Now, sometimes you have to change directories for certain reasons, but for the most part, I would say, specify the path to data using relative paths or something like that because that's going to be helpful when you give it to another person or you move to another computer or like, you know, that folder changes. But generally, R looks for files in, all, in your computer relative to the working directory. So if we go to your R Studio really briefly, this up here is where R is looking for those files. That's why we can just say youth tobacco survey. It knows it's in, it's in that folder. But again, you can set them. You can also go to the top uh, in tools or session set working directory. Now, just really briefly, uh, some of the structure dot dot goes up a level dot slash is this directory. Tility is your home directory, which is either users uh, slash your username on a Mac or do, uh, that my documents folder on a Windows. Now, also really briefly, anytime you use a, a path, you should be using forward slashes if you're on Windows or a Mac. Um, pretty much single backslashes are special things, but when you're specifying paths, use one forward slash. So again, dir is an example that can use programmatically to see the files inside of a directory. Dir will pump out the files in this directory, dir dot dot, is all the files in one directory above where you're at. So again, an absolute or full path points to the same location on a file system, regardless of the working directory. So it's like user slash John Michelle slash blah, 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 this file. That's great. But when you move computers, files change, file move, it's very problematic, especially when sharing code. So that's why we always try to use relative paths, which start from some working directory and then specify relative to that directory. So again, you could change these things by going to session, set working directory, to source file location, to the file panes location, things like that, um, which will allow you to set the working directory and give you the code. So um, make sure also that RStudio can open all .r files if you wanna use the set working directory to that source file so that when you open it up, you, it makes sure you're looking in that directory. So you can right click and say glit get info, open with RStudio for everything with the .r extension. Windows is a little bit um, different. You should be able to right click and hit open with um, or hit the properties to change that. So um, lastly, I'll talk about help. So anytime you wanna find the help, uh, the help files of some function, you should be able to use question mark function name or use the help function parentheses quote and then the function name in quotes. So for example, if I do question mark dir or help dir, it'll pull up the help file for dir. So this should pop up in your help directory. So the way you read this is um, 
this is a title, this is the description telling you what things do. Sometimes different functions are grouped together. So these three functions are grouped together because they do kind of similar things. These are the arguments for all those functions and what they do and what you need to pass in. This is what you get out, the value. Also some notes or some descriptions, who wrote the thing, see other file, uh, see other functions that are similar. And then it has examples, which you should be able to highlight and hit command enter or control enter to run. So help is very useful um, for these things. So again, we've already shown you problems in spec, but spec will allow you to give the specification out of how that data was read in, and you can copy and paste it in the future for your code. Problems will tell you uh, what are the problems that you have. DIM stands for the dimensions. It'll give you the number of rows and number of columns of a data set. Again, we talked about stop underscore four underscore problems. So if you have code, this will stop and break your code. If you have it run and the data changes and the specifications like, hey, I thought I saw this, but I saw something new. I turned it to missing, but I wanted to warn you about it. So um, again, uh, a tibble is a little bit different than a data frame, but a data frame will just print and print and print and print and print until it prints no more. A tibble is a bit smarter and will only print the first uh, set of data sets. Um, I'm going to skip over that. So lastly, uh, a couple things about the data. N row displays the number of rows of a data frame and call the number of columns. Dim rep gives you the number of rows and the number of columns back. It's a length two vector. Call names displays the column names. Row names displays the row names. So uh, I'm going to stop here and then I'm going to jump into the rename functions of the data.